Our next speaker is Sophie Cook. And Sophie has worked and studied throughout Latin America and the Caribbean for the past six and a half years as a teacher, environmental educator, first mate, and tour guide. Most recently, Sophie worked in coral restoration and terrestrial conservation initiatives in the US Virgin Islands. Inspired by these experiences to pursue research in tropical coast ecology, Sophie came to Scripps Institution of Oceanography to take advantage of the cutting edge research and science. The name of her project is The Curious Case of Curacao, Searching for Signals of Coral Resilience by Tracking Madrasis Mirabilis Through Time. Thank you, Samantha. This is Kane Bay, located in St. Croix, the US Virgin Islands. It was here that I was first exposed to the beauty and wonder of tropical coral reefs. The warm water, the colors glistening through the beams of light, schools of fish surrounding my bubbles. Close to a decade has passed since my first dive on this reef, and having spent so much time underwater here, I have witnessed a lot of change. I have watched many of my favorite corals, such as these, disappear, while new ones appear. And although it is certainly disheartening to witness these shifts, I became enamored with signs of resilience. The corals that seem to withstand the many environmental stressors our oceans face today. This curiosity pushed me to explore what contributes to resilience in coral reefs. Coral reefs are often described by their remarkable biodiversity, the ecosystem services and benefits they provide to people and the planet, and the difficult truth that coral reefs are now considered one of the most endangered ecosystems on the planet. What if I were to share an expanded narrative with you all today? That some coral species may be resilient despite human activity, indicative of how much left there is to understand surrounding these ecosystems. Coral reefs are a paradox of nature, for they are one of the most biodiverse, productive marine ecosystems, yet they shouldn't be. As they are found in nutrient-deplete tropical waters, which kind of make them like the food deserts of the oceans. Finding corals in these regions is like going to visit the Sahara Desert and instead you find the Amazon rainforest. This lack of food availability in these tropical waters led to corals being successful mixotrophs. Corals are mixotrophic organisms, meaning they have two feeding modes. They can feed autotrophically, which is another way of saying they can feed like trees and plants through photosynthesis. And they can do this due to the tiny microscopic algae they have within their tissues called symbiodinium or also referred to as zooxanthellae. And these photosynthetic algae can use the abundant tropical sunshine to provide food and energy to the coral. However, corals are also heterotrophs, which means that they can feed like you and me by consuming on outside organic matter. And they can do this through their tentacles and their cilia by feeding on zooplankton and bacteria and particulate matter in the water column when it's available. But when corals lose their ability to photosynthesize, photosynthesize, which can happen from varying environmental stressors, from warming waters, sea level rise, sedimentation from coastal development, to eutrophication, how and what do they eat in these nutrient deplete tropical waters in which they exist? Recent research suggests that a way a coral eats and an increased resource availability to feed can affect its ability to withstand environmental stressors. Corals that are more heterotrophic than autotrophic or those corals that can increase their uh, feeding rate in response to food availability in the water column, might be better adapted to environmental changes by increasing their feeding rate in response to food availability when photosynthesis is inhibited. So this is where I introduce you to the star of the story, Madrasis mirabilis. Focus your attention on these yellow patches you see throughout the video, and if you can see my mouse, this is going to be the same point on the reef through these five time points. And what I want you to focus on is how these yellow patches remain relatively unchanged across time. To my delight, I realized that the feeding strategy of this coral, coral is largely heterotrophic, meaning that it can efficiently feed on zooplankton, bacteria, and other particulate matter in the water column. And it has become one of the most abundant coral species on a small island in the Southern Caribbean. Curacao. Curacao hosts some of the most notable coral cover and biodiversity left in the Caribbean. While coral cover on this island is often double of that than in the broader Caribbean, its reefs have not been protected from the impacts of human activity. 
fishing pressure, and coastal development exacerbated by climate change have caused declines in coral cover across the island. Learning that Madrasus mirabilis is now one of the most abundant coral species across the shallow coral reefs of Curacao, I decided to study the growth and distribution of this species across seven sites spanning 40 kilometers along the leeward or protected coast of Curacao. And just to clarify, the names that you see on this map are just names of our study sites and the plots of reef that we studied. Uh, they aren't the names of ports or cities or anything like that. For my research, I wanted to address the following questions. How does resource availability affect the percent cover, growth, and distribution of a heterotrophic coral species, Madrasus mirabilis, across Curacao? How does percent cover and growth of Madrasus mirabilis change in relation to naturally occurring nutrients and anthropogenic or human-caused inputs of nutrients? Yes, it's working. So for this study, I had the unique opportunity to utilize data from the 100 Island Challenge which is an initiative out of the Sandin and Smith Labs to collect data on coral reefs from, well, you guessed it, 100 different islands. The data collected through 100 Island Challenge is essentially a digital archive of these coral reefs, consisting of 2D images and 3D models, such as this one that I just showed to you today, that are snapshots of these reefs frozen in time. Using this large area imagery, we can ask and answer question about how these reefs are changing over time and space in relation to different environmental stressors and changing oceanographic conditions. So this was probably my favorite part of my research as I got to work with 3D models such as these um, from the comfort of my desk each day and I got to take these virtual time traveling scuba dives without ever entering the water. Although I much prefer entering the water. <laughs> um, so I worked with these uh, 3D models for each of our seven study sites that were 3D reconstructions of the reefs which allowed me to visualize how these reefs are changing over time. And after working with these models to ensure they were properly oriented, scaled, and aligned, I then converted them into these 2D planar maps you see on the right side that gave me a bird's eye view of the reef. And I uploaded these images into a software called TagLab, which is very similar to Paint, if you've ever used that on your Microsoft operating system. Uh, <laughs> and that it's a little bit different in, the in that it allows me to annotate and segment um, different coral colonies, such as these yellow blobs of Madrasus mirabilis. And by doing this, I can see how their size and total area covered changes through time. And we only traced corals within this 10 by 10 meter plot, um, and anything outside of that was omitted. And this is about half the size of a tennis court to give you some um, reference for the size. So this tracing that you see here was repeated for five time points from 2016 to 2020 for all seven sites. Uh, these two images represent one of the um, time series. So this is the first time point and this is the last time point. And so we can compare these yellow blobs over time to see how their total planar area changes in time, which we can then con convert to percent cover. Um, so what I'd like to direct your attention to here, because this is one of my favorite sites, because um, you can really see the change in growth. So here in the center, you can see a lot of fragmented colonies, and they're much smaller in size. And as you move to 2020, you can see how they've begun to clump together and fuse back together, increasing in total area. So after extracting data like these from TagLab, we could then compare them to environmental variables to see how the availability of resources might affect the growth and distribution of this coral species. Environmental data were taken from a 2015 study conducted by Dr. Stuart Sandin, among many others, in which they collected data on a, from 122 sites across Curacao, as you can see here on the map. Two data points were used from this study as measures of resource availability. We looked at anthropogenic inputs of nutrients, and I was able to, these values were derived from algal samples collected near each site, in which they looked at a stable isotope of nitrogen, and it gives us a relative profile for the amount of human pollution that enters these sites, and the amount of eutrophication happening in these areas. And then we also looked at naturally occurring nutrients, using chlorophyll A as a proxy for oceanic productivity. And it can tell us how much naturally occurring food is available for these corals to feed upon. And then we compared these two types of nutrients across the coast of Curacao to see how their loads and concentrations differed across the region. We hypothesized that Madrasus mirabilis, a predominantly heterotrophic coral, will show higher growth rates and percent cover in nutrient-rich waters in response to anthropogenic inputs of nutrients and natural oceanic productivity. So what I hope to address through this research was to see how resource availability could affect the survivorship and growth of corals that are more heterotrophic than autotrophic. So our results were quite surprising. 
Opposite to our hypothesis, oceanic productivity did not seem to be related to an increase in cover of Madrasis mirabilis. So along this map here, along the northern part of the island, we had our highest chlorophyll A values, but then we had some of our, oh, this mouse is crazy. <laughs> we had some of our lowest percent cover of Madrasis mirabilis in West Punt, Paradise, and Playa Hulu. As you move farther south down the coast, this chlorophyll A concentrations decrease, but as you can see on the right side of the graph, we have our highest percent cover of Madrasis mirabilis. So this is where the data got really interesting for me. Uh, these are our values for that pollution proxy or that stable isotope of nitrogen that gives us a measure of how much human impact or human pollution has entered these sites. So among uh, the northern sites, we had relatively low pollution proxy values, and we also had low average percent cover of Madrasis mirabilis. As you move farther south towards the capital of the island, Willemstad, where there's higher coastal development and greater population density, it makes sense that those values increase. Um, and here is where we had the highest average percent cover of Madrasis mirabilis. So this map just combines the average percent cover you saw from the previous maps, um, but except this time it's represented in these yellow blobs. And we have three different colors going on throughout this map. Uh, the green represents the highest naturally occurring nutrients. Yellow represents low in both types of nutrients. And red rep represents high anthropogenic inputs of nutrients. So when looking at the growth rates and the changes in average percent cover from 2016 to 2020 in our sites with the highest chlorophyll A concentrations, uh, only West Punt showed a, an appreciable change in percent cover or growth from 2016 to 2020, and it had the highest average percent cover among these sites. Pesh Bay, the percent cover among the um, time points remained relatively stagnant, and we did not see much change, and it also had the lowest concentrations for both types of nutrients. However, the sites with the highest anthropogenic nutrient loading or the highest human impact, uh, we had the highest percent cover and the highest growth rates. So buoy two, although we didn't um, find any significance for um, an appreciable change in growth from 2016 to 2020, it did have the highest average percent cover among these time points, ranging around 35% uh, throughout the entire series. Water factory showed a moderate change in growth from 2016 to 2020, and sea aquarium, as you can see, had the highest growth rates, starting at around 28% and ending at around 35% cover in 2020. So these data may show us that Madrasis mirabilis could be more tolerant to pollution and anthropogenic inputs of nutrients, as it can grow and survive in these areas most impacted by human activity. While we found an environmental signal to suggest that this coral may be better adapted to human-related stressors, this story is not without caveats. Do these data mean we should continue business as usual, develop more coastlines, and dump more pollution in the water? Absolutely not. <laughs> just because one coral, just wanna make that clear. <laughs> uh, just because one coral seems to withstand these stressors related to human activity does not mean that other species are doing well in these areas. Other experiments and observations should be paired with these findings to see how other environmental and biological variables may be at play. With further investigation, these data could be applied to resource management and coral restoration practices when deciding where to designate marine protected areas or which types of corals they want to outplant onto degraded reefs. The message of this story should not downplay our responsibility to ensure coral reefs are here for future generations, as we must urgently address the many local and global impacts caused by us. However, what excites me the most about these data is seeing how much is left to learn surrounding the resilience of coral reefs. While future reefs may look very different from what we imagine a coral reef to be, there are seeds of hope. Science-driven solutions require many pieces to solve the complex environmental issues we are facing, as you've seen today and these data are merely one piece of a much larger puzzle. Uh, I would like to thank my committee, especially for your investment of time and energy into this project. project. Uh, Stuart Sandin, Mark Vermey, Brian Zaglinski, and Kate Furby, it was a dream come true to work with experts like you. To the Sandin Lab, uh, this project would not have been, been possible without your support, um, as you provide me the training and patience and support throughout this year and your passion and dedication to this field continue to inspire me. And to the many others, Samantha, Greg, Mark, my cohort, friends, family, thank you so much for your relentless support and encouragement over the past year. Thank you. Amanda? 
amazing presentation. Um, so this coral that you studied, does it play a different role ecologically than some of the other corals, like as in terms of being a host for other species? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if there are a lot of different questions I wasn't able to address in this study. Uh, I'm wondering if decreased competition for space may have played into that, as other corals couldn't handle the nutrient enrichment as Madrasus mirabilis can. Um, I would like to look further into how um, much nitrogen this coral is able to uptake through autotrophy and heterotrophy and see how it affects the water column in these areas most impacted by human activity. I don't know if that answers your question. Hi, Sophie. Hi. Great, great presentation. So how really like interesting scientific data heavy findings how will you make sure that um, folks beyond the scientific community will be made aware of these findings, particularly wondering if you have any plans to share these findings with folks in Curacao? Thank you so much for that question. I actually have a slide on that. <laughs> um, so while I was working with these 3D models and these 2D visualizations of the reef, I kept thinking about how these, um, these graphics could be utilized to share how coral reefs look and how they're changing and share the message of how dynamic and resilient these ecosystems are. So I created an interactive story map that will be used across the Dutch Caribbean in schools and outreach and education programs for students to use these same 3D models and the visualizations that I used um, to be able to ask and answer their own ecological questions and hopefully be inspired to become coral scientists of their own. Um, this is just a draft of it. I'm gonna continue to work on it throughout the summer. And then in August and September, I hope to launch this with um, different organizations in Curacao. This is a slider that they can move back and forth and see how it changes, and I'll do that for all of the different study sites. Very cool. Um, we have a question from the web from Tom Baker, and he's wondering how large were the differences in nutrient availability across these sites, and what drives it, other than possibly sewage or other kinds of runoff? Can you, can you repeat the first part? How large are the How large differences? were the differences in nutrient availability so across these I'll sites? I'll go back up to my previous slides. So for chlorophyll A concentrations, they didn't vary that much, and that could have impacted the results of the study, among other environmental variables, um, including wave action. Um, but for the anthropogenic inputs of um, nutrients, which is usually related to wastewater and sewage and runoff from agricultural practices, I know it doesn't seem like these values vary that much, but anything from 0 to 1.5 represents um, natural uh, fixation of nitrogen in these algal samples, and anything from about 1.5 to I think 4.5 um, respectively represents that it's runoff from agriculture, and anything above that represents um, sewage inputs. Sylvie, it's, it's been great to sit here through your presentation and everyone else's presentations today. I'm, I'm thinking of parallels with other projects. Uh, Alish's project on biodiversity comes to mind in the deep sea, and Raquel's project on sewage and uh, other small islands in the Caribbean, and I'm wondering um, if you were able, and I know the capstone's kind of intense and it's an individual <laughs> project, but if you were able to um, discuss with other folks or if there's opportunities to link up some of these findings between projects. Uh, so as I said, I'm working a little bit with the Dutch Caribbean Nature Alliance, um, and they work with many different organizations throughout the Dutch Caribbean. Um, so I'm working with them to um, share the story map, but also get those findings out there by sharing data and uh, summary of my findings. 